Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. We have a beautiful rainy day here in Washington, D.C. And on the phone with us, with us this morning is Deb Trocha. Deb is the Executive Director of the Indiana Cooperative Development Center, ICDC. Good morning, Deb. Good morning, Vernon. Appreciate the opportunity to be on your program this morning. Well, I always appreciate the opportunity of talking to you and talking about co-ops. Thank you for taking the time out and come join us. Where are you this morning? I am in rainy Indianapolis, working from home still. All right. Rainy Indianapolis. Uh, I lived out your way for about five years. I lived in Columbus, Indiana, right a little bit south of you for five right, years. Right, about an hour away. I like that part of the world. Deb, you're coming up with a program called Co-ops and Diverse Communities, and I really wanted to talk to you today about this program, particularly with everything that's happening after George Floyd and the uh, Co-op Impact Conference dealing with diversity, uh, equality, and inclusion. So what is this Co-ops and Diverse Community? What is this about? You're having a uh, program all day tomorrow. What's that about? So. It's my attempt, the center's attempt, to show black and brown communities the successes of black and brown people across the country that have had in the co-op community. And in particular, tomorrow, our focus is on worker co-ops. Black and brown communities have a very, very long history of success in the co-op community, but a lot of that knowledge has been lost over time. And Jessica gordon Ebhard book talks about that in, in a lot of detail. And as a matter of fact, Jessica was one of our first speakers when we started this conference four or five years ago. So this is an attempt to make sure that folks who tend to be in those communities who are marginalized, who don't have access to the ability to start perhaps their own businesses on their own, here's an opportunity to start a business be part of the business um, with other like-minded individuals. So as you, as you and I have talked about, um, I'm of the opinion that if you have a need, a business need, there is a co-op solution for that need. So this is our opportunity to show the black and brown community that, that here, you know, there are others out there in black and brown communities who are starting co-ops being very successful at it. So here's your chance to learn from others and perhaps start your own co-op. So I like, I love it. You, you're showcasing co-ops for the black and brown communities, showing folks out there, here's some people that are black and brown that come from communities that you, you live in and they're starting successful co-ops or they have started successful co-ops. So let me just, how do how does somebody find out about this? How does somebody sign up for it? Actually, I should have sent you that link. There is, while we're talking, let me, I'll send you the link. Um, but there's a link to register. You can do it from our website at icdc.coop. There's a link on the website there under events. So anybody out there that's interested in, in starting a co-op or listening to people that already started successful co-ops, go to icdc.coop. That's the web page for the Indiana Cooperative Development Center, icdc.coop, and then click on events. And when you come to that page, and I'm looking at it, Deb, you've got uh, creating wealth through employee ownership. That happened yesterday. And now today, tomorrow, it's happening today? Yes, right after this, we have a webinar. Okay, creating wealth through employment ownership. 
And that's you're talking about the silver tsunami of all of these folks that are over 55 that are changed. You said there's 41,000 businesses in Indiana that are owned by people over 55, and they're going to be transitioned. The, the transitioning those business for either their children, and a lot of children don't want to own them, or we talk about the option that they can they can transition them to their employees. That's a 90 minute webinar tomorrow. I want I mean today. I want to see if I can get on that today too. And then co-ops and diverse communities is tomorrow from nine to three. And you can go on their webpage icdc.coop. And click on events, and then co-ops and diversity, co-ops and diverse communities. You click on that, and then you can register. Right. Right. Great. Absolutely. I like this. I want to talk more about it, but I'm excited. Um, thank you for for doing this. Why? Why did you start doing this? You're not black or brown. Why you start doing it? <coughs> well, I. I'm <laughs> We also host a national conference for startup food co-ops. And several years ago, I was at a conference in Texas and was listening to a very prominent, and I won't name names, prominent African-American um, speaker who had recently been to our conference called Up and Coming. And he indicated that he had not felt comfortable at that conference. And... As a conference organizer, I was stricken that I was hosting an event and some of my some of the attendees did not feel comfortable. So we started um, a track within that conference called People of Color, and it was devoted towards or to people of color starting food co-ops. And I thought, well, hey, if we can do that just for food co-ops, then why don't I do a separate event? For Indiana, normally this is not a virtual event, it's an in-person event, and showcase black and brown people from across the country who are working in co-ops to show folks here in Indiana what that looks like, that they too can start a co-op in their black and brown communities and be successful at it. Okay. So you're, you're hosting the Up and Coming, which I did go to a year ago beginning of last year, and I really enjoyed it. But did this person say why they felt uncomfortable in that event, and how long ago was that? Oh, that's probably been a good seven years ago. I don't remember the details. I just, you know, you put two and two together, you have a black person coming to to a predominantly white event and saying, hey, I didn't feel comfortable, I didn't feel welcome. I don't want anybody coming to any type of co-op event that I'm hosting and not feel comfortable, no matter what color their skin, what they look like. That's just not acceptable. So um, we started being very intentional about trying to be much more inclusive. And if you came to Up and Coming Now, I think you would see a decided difference. And Vernon, you can bear me out on this, that... A good third, I would think, of the attendees are now out of the black community. And if you're familiar with food co-ops, they sometimes get a bad rap because they tend to be in very, you know, suburban communities, tend to be predominantly white, but that's changing. It's changing for the better. There's lots of um, co-op development happening in the food space, food co-op space, in a lot of urban communities. So it is awesome, and uh, I know there was a group here that was was trying to start one in Ward Eight. Ward Eight is a food desert. You don't. It's hard to get good fresh vegetables on the other side of the Anacostia River. And like I said, I was there. It's almost two years ago. It was January or February of of nineteen, and a really diverse group of people there. So, yeah, I can bear that out. But I want to go back to this uncomfortableness and not feeling welcome. The reason is you mentioned Jessica Gordon Nimhart, and she was on the show last week. Uh, She's been on four or five times. I just learn a lot from this lady every time I talk to her anywhere. And Pat Norton, the producer, um, got her on because she had given this keynote at the cooperative – Impact Conference, the NCBA Inclusive puts on, 
And she was talking about why there is racism in co-ops, even though that most co-ops don't believe it's there because of that first principle. It's open to everybody, regardless of race or religion or politics or gender or age. It doesn't, it, it's open, but too often a co-op set in a racist environment, the U.S., there's, there's racism that follows over and got to get white cooperators to see that. And I'm glad you saw that seven years ago with that cooperator saying, I didn't feel comfortable. And she was saying some of the reasons that people don't feel comfortable is there are no black people around. There's no black people in the literature. There's no black folks uh, on the dais. And that's changed. I got it. Because when I was there, it was very comfortable. And then a lot of times uh, you say you're new and it's almost got to be this affirmative action. You have to put some action on because people are not there. And it's mostly in this case, white, and you're bringing in blacks that somewhere you've got to put some action to make sure that that person feels welcome and is welcome and know that they're welcome. So I'm glad you did it. Congratulations. Well, thanks. It's, it's been, um, it's been exciting to see the growth in the diversity in the up and coming conference. And then with this conference that we're doing tomorrow, really highlighting the work that black and brown cooperators um, are accomplishing in their communities, not only for themselves as owners of the co-op, but the impact that it has in the community as well. So you said this was exciting. What, what caused it to be so exciting for you? People recognizing or being able to follow through on their dream of being a business owner. Owning a business and starting a business is difficult, and starting a co-op is difficult. But in the, in the cooperative space, you're doing it with other people. You're not doing it in a vacuum. You're not, you know, doing it all by yourself. Um, so really, you know, someone being able to recognize that dream of business ownership being able to uplift others in the community, having an impact in the community. I mean, that's, to me, that's exciting. It is. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you got it, Deb. I, I, so I'm looking at Deb on, on Zoom and she's, we're talking through the, through the uh, radio, but I'm looking on Zoom and she's just perked up. The excitement is right there all in her face. And I'm so glad that she got it. And that person said and had the, uh, the comfort level to saying, I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel welcomed in your conference. And then she took action. And that's, that's what happens in this co-op space and that people can get how to start a business. So when we come back, we're going to take our first break here. We're going to come back and talk about how you start a cooperative business and some of the things that you will learn uh, by joining this, this group. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. Um, WL is a great partner because, as you just heard, information is power. But a gentleman uh, by the name of Papa Sin was on this program seven years ago, Deb. Uh, he is from Senegal, and he works for NCBA Clusa. And he said, you know, it's not information um, – where you get the power, or, or another way of saying it, information is like stored power. It only becomes power when you put some action to it. Mm. And so WOL's motto is information is power. NCB is sponsoring this program to give you information about co-ops, of the benefits of them, how you start them, how you create them, what, what you get from them, and what the community gets from these cooperatives. But you have to put some action. And so one action I would like for you to take is to go to icdc.coop and sign up for this conference tomorrow, Co-ops in Diverse Communities, and so that you can get the information about how to start a co-op or listening to other co-ops. In this case, you're talking about worker co-ops tomorrow, and you can find out how you can get a group of people together of like minds and start your own business. It's hard work, as Deb has already said. Uh, but it's very, very, very rewarding work. You create your own jobs, you create your own money, your own wealth, and you learn, 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 learn. 
Deb, tell me what this what you're doing tomorrow. What are some of the kinds of things you're doing, and who's going to be there? Okay, so um, we're going to start the day with a presentation on what are the steps to start a worker co-op. So it's all well and good to hear about worker co-ops and how awesome they are, but this presentation is going to take you step by step how to actually start a worker co-op. And um, Rudeline Volsey, um, who is with the Democracy at Work Institute, is the speaker. I've heard her give this presentation, and she does a fabulous job, really detailed. You will walk away with some very concrete steps about if if you want to start your own worker co-op, she's going to lay it all out for you, make it very easy. And then throughout the day, we've got three. Well, well, before you you move on, let's talk a little bit more about that starting a worker co-op. That's the first thing. I'm going to be on that one I because uh, uh, we have just created a everything co-op communications LLC and we're we're looking to start it as a worker co-op so I'm really wanting to know those steps I have ideas about them but I figure I can't do anything but learn but tell me a little bit about either a root line or what are the steps that you take a sort of summary of what people can get out of that that workshop what I can get out of it Okay, so Rudeline, um, she has actually been involved in the startup of a food co-op. She has traveled extensively. She has lots of experience. So she's going to speak from experience about, you know, what what kinds of things worked, what didn't work, you know, all from the germination of an idea of people sitting around and discover that they have similar needs and wants and how you take that kernel of an idea and create a business out of that. How you communicate that idea with others who have similar interests, how you start the whole process of getting people interested, how you create the governing documents, um, how you go about if you need financing, how you do that, how to identify professionals who can help you with that process making sure that you have an accountant and an attorney that's going to help you through that that kind of paperwork process. <clears throat> Creating a business of any kind doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not created by just a single individual in a co-op. That's even more so. There's a group of people who, who are very invested in ensuring that this dream, this vision that they have becomes a reality. And so step-by-step, how you create that steering committee, how you start recruiting members, how you approach um, lenders if you need financing, how you market the business once you've created it. How do you let people know that the business is there? Um, There's a whole litany of steps that she's going to go through, and they're not dissimilar from creating another type of business, but in in creating a co-op, you're doing it as a group. And it takes a little bit different mindset in that you are thinking about the good of the whole as opposed to your own personal good. I mean, that's part of it, but you really are creating an entity where everyone is going to benefit, especially in a worker co-op. That, that's even, even more um, uh, a looking at how each person, how, they, how the puzzle fits together. Because a worker co-op, not only are you the employees, the workers in the business, but you also own the business. So it's, again, a different, it's a different um, mind shift. It's a little bit, you have to think a little bit differently. So as an employee in a business, you can work your eight hours, you can go home and not have to think about it at all. But as part of a worker co-op, I mean, you're always thinking about, you know, how do I improve the business? How do I make the business better? Because it's all about you're not creating a business for some set of outside investors. You're creating this business and growing it for you and the other worker owners inside that business. So you really have an incentive to do your best to grow the business. What you're talking about is so phenomenal. And the first time I got a a hint of this was uh, seven years ago again with Rodney North, who was with Equal Exchange. Uh, mm-hmm. 150 member worker cooperative, and he said at one point he was uh, the president of the board, and so 
they would be in a meeting in the daytime, and he would be taking orders from the chief operating officer with his boss, and he would be taking orders. And at night at a board meeting, his boss would be taking orders from him. I never thought about that, <laughs> that that's sort of uh, him and the board, but that that the change of, of roles and the different relationships you just won't find in the capitalistic model that, that no. Rodney is a worker and has that kind of power and control and input and voice in the, in the, in the uh, business. So uh, that was very, very interesting that, that people can have that kind of voice in a worker cooperative, but it does mean that you spend more time. You've got to work eight hours a day, and then you have the time that it takes to govern the business, to make decisions and policies, and so that does take more time. But it's extremely rewarding from everybody I've talked to in these seven years in worker co-ops, uh, extremely rewarding to – well, let me ask you this question. Do you like what you do? Absolutely. So you get up in the morning and you don't want to go to work or you just dread it? Oh, no, I love going to work. Um, it's easy these days because I just have to walk down the hall to get to the office, <laughs> which is in a spare bedroom right now. But, no, um, every day it's something different, um, working on some new project, so it's never boring. And, again, it's about helping people realize a dream. Um, it's kind of like if you're a – a teacher, and the student finally gets the concept that you're trying to get them to understand. As a co-op developer, it's it's helping people take that nebulous idea or dream that they have, walking them through the process to actually creating a business on the other end and it being a successful business so that they're, you know, they're able to realize that dream of whatever, whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish knowing that you had some small part in helping them realize that dream. It's exciting. So out of seven years, let's say we've had 350 different conversations. I normally ask that question. It doesn't make any difference if it's if somebody works in a worker cooperative or they're doing development like you are, they're providing technical assistance and training. Everybody says the same thing. They love their work. And that's the, the point I wanted to make is that, it's drudgery, and I, I worked a job I, I, almost a year at Ford in the foundry in the factory, and it was drudgery getting up and going to work. It was painful, uh, not only for me but for the other guys on that line. But it, it's so it's so much rewarding where you get up and like, yes, let's go to work. Hot dog. That's yeah. But co-ops are based on the values of self-help. That's the first thing: the helping the self, self-responsibility, democracy, equality equity and solidarity. And in, in the tradition of the founders of cooper, cooperative members believe in the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. I like to say caring for one another. Uh, so it's self-help. You're helping self, but in this, in this bubble of working for and helping each other. And that's what causes people to have so much excitement about this, this work. And, uh, I knew what your answer was going to be because I've watched you at, at the up and coming conference and in different um, settings, and you really love this work, and I, I, I applaud you for it. I applaud you for it. Well, we're going to take our next break. Only thing I wanted to say is I looked up Rylan Voley's uh, bio, and she's from Haiti. And she'll be doing this first conference, and I'm looking forward to it. So she's a person of color. I assume that she's born in Haiti. So she's a person of color talking to people of color about starting up worker co-op. We'll be right back, everybody. Please don't touch that dial. Back everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. We have Deb Trocher, who's the executive director of the International, the Indiana Cooperative Development Center, <laughs> ICDC. I, I want to take you to international, Deb. I think what you're <laughs> talking about is 
it, were, it could be worldwide. You're in Indiana, and I got it, and I don't think they'd want to lose you, uh, but you could be a, a bigger focus. Maybe you could become the president of ICA one day, okay, um, in a uh-huh. corporate alliance. So what we're talking about is the uh, event that's starting tomorrow, the co-ops and diverse communities. Deb has told us that it came about because a person came to a conference about seven years ago on how to start food co-ops that they were having, called Up and Coming, and uh, he had announced that he didn't feel welcome as a black man. So she did something about it, and one of the things was they started something at the Up and Coming called People of Color. They have a, a whole segment on that, and then this Up and Coming, this co-op in diverse communities, uh, which is tomorrow, and it's uh, reimagining work. Reimagining work is about black and brown folks and the success that black and brown people have had in this co-op sphere. I'm going to give examples of that. So, Deb, tell us some of the examples. Who's 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 up next after Rylan uh, Volley uh, about how you start a co-op? Who's up next on the on the, your agenda? So the next segment is built around technology type co-ops. So I have two speakers. Sahiba Basri, and I'm probably butchering her name, so I apologize. She is a a worker owner of a design collective in Oakland, and uh, she is a young Muslim woman and very politically active in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then the other speaker um, is Matt Feinstein, and he works with youth. Um, it's a youth training program of uh, black and brown youth and um, training them in TV and film production. So you're getting to see two very different types of worker co-ops, but in that technology space, one working with youth, which I think is incredibly exciting, really, you know, getting to people younger so that they grow up understanding about the co-op business model and something that they can aspire to once they, you know, graduate high school and go on with their lives. And then Sahiba, um, she has been doing organizing, community organizing since uh, right after 9-11. I'm really excited for you to hear their stories coming from very different parts of the country, one from Massachusetts, one from the West Coast, but still using that same worker co-op model. So it's applicable to lots of different industries anywhere in the country. So what's the, what is Design in Action? Again, I missed that. What does that company do? It is a graphic design and web development cooperative. And their particular focus is working with social justice movement. So they really put into practice, you know, not only the, you know, the worker co-op, but their philosophy about, you um, the social justice movement. So they really are putting their money where their mouths are, so to speak, and they're walking the walk and talking the talk. So I'm really excited to hear her story. And then this other future focused media um, is all about training youth, um, not only helping them understand the cooperative model, but also helping them learn skills in TV and film production. Okay. So, I know I was going to be at the 9 o'clock one. Now I'm really curious about hearing <laughs> both of those stories. So it sounds like I might, and they're, and, and they're from 1030 to 1145. And, again, if you want to hear these stories, go to icdc.coop, click on events, and then you can register for this. Is there a charge for this uh, conference? Um, it's $15. And a whole fifteen dollars? Yes. A whole fifteen? Well, I think most yeah. people could probably do that. That's a lunch. Okay. And if you're a student, it's how much? It's five dollars. I'm a student of life. Okay, that, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and if that doesn't work for you, then shoot me an email and we can work something out. That's what I expect. If you if it doesn't work, you don't have the fifteen or the five. Um Shoot Deb an email at where? Deb at? At dtroka at icdc.coop. So D-R-O-K-A. 
C-H-A at I-C-D-C dot C-O-O-P. Okay. So the idea is to get the information out. And listen, that's the fifth principle of cooperation is training, education, uh, and information. The the big, and that's why I first liked co-ops is uh, I taught for 12 years and my mother was a school teacher. So my grandfather said, Vernon, get an education. And I'll say the, the rest of this because you, uh, you, you understand this. He would say over and over again, drunk or sober, get an education, boy. That's the only thing a white man can't take from you. I, he did not have it. What my mother would tell me is get an education, boy. That's the way you can make a good living. And I found out that's the way you can make good choices, the more education you have. And I've had people on this show, Deb, that tells me the education they get in co-ops, how you run a co-op, how you operate a co-op, how you learn how to get together, how you resolve conflict, because you're going to have conflict, has helped them in their personal life. They end up with budgets in their personal life. They have better relationship with their children and then their spouses or significant others uh, because they learn these skills about running a co-op. So Very I like co-ops for that fifth, fifth principle. It's phenomenal. Okay, so I got the morning for you from 9 to 12 right now. <laughs> okay. okay. So you've got somebody from Haiti that's going to talk about how you start a co-op. You have a lady that is, you said Muslim, that's going to talk about uh, social justice. She's been working since 9-11 on social justice active. And Matt mm-hmm. is, what's his background? Uh, he was his... I got his gender, um, but what's see. his race? He, he's white. He's the only white person on the program, but the people he works with are the black, black and brown youth. I'm looking at his bio here. Um, he's passionate, again, about social and environmental justice and supporting you to become the agents of change. So, you know, normally all of our speakers on this program are black and are black or brown but this this project, this co-op, um, I really like the idea of educating youth so that as they're growing up, co-ops are just a natural part of their thinking process. Um, so as they come through school, they decide to go to college or not, the, uh, the cooperative model and idea is already in their brains. I went to business school. They didn't talk about co-ops. So I came to it at a much later point in my life. So co-op like this really is training young people up in the cooperative movement so that those skills that you were talking about earlier, they're learning at a very young age and they take it with them as they go out into the into the workspace and hopefully start their own cooperative. Well, you and I have a similar uh, story in that I went to Stanford and got an MBA, okay, I went there because I wanted to figure out how to make money, how to how to make a living. That's what my grand my, my mother told me to do, get an education. But they didn't talk co-op. I didn't learn about co-ops until I started managing co-ops. I was forty five years old when I started when I learned about co-ops. Boy, if what would it have been like my life, my, my personal and business life, if I'd have learned about it in junior high or high school or college to get this right. and, and those people that come on the show that learn it that early? It's amazing what they're able to do in life. Amazing their outlook on life. So yes, I I like that you're having them on, and I really want to hear him. <laughs> okay. All right, you're taking up my day, and I think I'm gonna love it. So then you have a break, and then what's up next? So the next segment is looking at. So perhaps you you're not interested. Maybe you didn't go to college, okay? Or maybe you did. And you like working with your hands. So the next segment is I have a speaker talking about a cleaning service cooperative and a landscaping cooperative. And the cleaning cooperative was a startup as a cleaning cooperative. The interesting thing about the landscaping co-op is that it was um, owned by an individual who transitioned it to a worker co-op. It's a really cool story. It's called A Yard and a Half. It's in the Boston area. And uh, the speaker, Eulalio, is, um, he is from El Salvador. And all of the worker owners in this cooperative are Latino. It's a really cool story. 
the owner really wanted to ensure that her business succeeded and she wanted to take care of her workers. So when she created the business, she had kind of in the back of her head that eventually she wanted to transition this to a worker co-op, which is what she did. And Eulalia is going to talk a little bit about that. And then uh, Daniela, who is talking about the cleaning service cooperative, she's also uh, a Latina, and she is starting her second, launching her second cooperative business. Um, it is a um, as a consultant um, and a certified coach and trainer. She's going to be providing consulting services to the Latinx community. And Daniela is on the board of directors of the Federation of Worker Cooperatives. So she's really involved in the worker cooperative community, not only locally, but at a national level. So I think both of these individuals are going to be able to perhaps put a little bit different spin on um, the whole worker co-op space. And Nulalio is, um, you know, came from El Salvador, so he... As a not as a young person either, he didn't arrive in Boston until 1999, and I'm not 100% sure if that was, you know, that the year he came to the United States. So immigrants face a huge issue a lot of times in finding meaningful work and employment. So mm-hmm. being part of a worker co-op kind of solves that issue in that they've created their own business. So there really is an opportunity, no matter if, you know, you've lived in the United States your entire life or you're coming here from another country, the business, the co-op business model works for everyone in any industry that you can imagine. So I'm excited for you to hear that story, hear both of their stories. And um, do you want to wait to talk about the last one after the break? Yes. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of things in here. Um, so I've had several people on the air talk about uh, their worker co-op. And one of the biggies, well, I read in a book called Cities Building Community Wealth by the Democracy Collaborative, a lady by the name of Christina, who's a Mexican-American, who was perhaps she liked working with her hands like you talked about. But more often than not, I find out they don't have, folks don't have any skill sets uh, or, or education and maybe they are immigrants, and the only thing they can do is work with their hands. That may be the only choice. But then the question is, do you work for somebody or do you work for yourself? And Christina was work, making $7 an hour working for somebody else. When she started working in the worker co-op, she made 20 bucks an hour. And yeah. so if at 7 bucks an hour, 40 hours a week, she would make $280. But at 20 bucks an hour, she don't have to work 14 hours to get that same $280. So she worked less and spent more time with her two children because she was a single mom. So the whole community gets better off by working working in a cooperative, starting one or working one. And we're going to take our final break, (laughs) and we'll be back to talk about the rest of your day tomorrow. Please don't touch that dial. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. We we have Miss Deb Troth. Trocha on the line with us today talking about a reimagining work a conference that they're having tomorrow, which is virtual. So anywhere you are, you can sign up for it. The National Corporate Banks sponsors this program and they've been sponsoring it for seven years. They are a great sponsor in that not only do they provide financial help, but they've also given us a lot of advice on who we could talk to, what we could talk about. And Chuck Snyder and the folks uh, at NCB, well, let me put it into words of McDonald from from Cabot Creamery. She said that those folks are angels with the work that they do. And I would suggest that Deb Troches, uh, the folks at Indiana Corporate Development, uh, ICDC, is, they're also angels. They're really helping people, and she really loves what she's doing. So, Deb, I'd like for you to talk about your next segment for tomorrow conference. Oh, by the way, before you talk about it, go to icdc.coop and sign up. Hit events and sign up for this conference. Deb, what's your what's your last session session tomorrow? Okay, so last but not least, absolutely. Think about the people in your life who are elderly, who want to age in place in their homes. They don't want to go to 
um, a group facility, they want to stay in their home, or perhaps you know someone who has a disability, or um, perhaps someone who is a veteran um, who's wounded, who you know has mobility issues, enter home care co-ops. And I'm a boomer, and the boomer generation is huge, and we are aging. And I, for one, don't want to go anywhere else, but I want to live in my own home. But if it gets to the point where I need assistance with that, then a home care cooperative, which is worker co-op, would be a perfect solution. And Georgia Allen and her partner in crime, I guess if you want to call it that, Josette Bridges, are in uh, Wisconsin, and they have started a home care co-op called Soaring Independent. And it sounds like I don't know a lot about their story, but from what little I do know, I think they probably came out of this industry, which is typically very low paid, high turnover, not a lot of opportunity for advancement. Because there's so much turnover in that industry, then oftentimes the clients don't get the same quality of care that they that you would like them to have. So enter the worker co-op model for home care co-ops. Great solution to a problem uh, to an issue that's going to continue to grow over time. So I'm really excited to have Georgia and Josette on the program to talk about as two black women, how did they start this worker co-op? Why did they do this? You know, if they were already working in the industry, why did they take on this this adventure, if you will, of starting a cooperative? So um, I've talked with others, to um, some folks at USDA who have worked with them to get started, and they talk very highly about Georgia, her energy level, her excitement. Um, so I'm really, really glad that she's on the program and we get to hear her story about how she and other black women came together and created this worker co-op to provide assistance to people who are um, in need of services as they're aging in place or, you know, have other issues to where um, they're at home and need additional services. Okay. So what you're doing, uh, Deb, and I don't know if you know this or not, but you're taking my Friday. <laughs> okay. I wanted to hear that story too. <laughs> I'm not interested in starting a home health care, but I am. I just turned 73 the beginning of this month. Okay, so I'm in that boomer thing, and I'll be. I do not want to go into one of those places. So yeah, getting a home health care is really critical to me, or knowing about that as I as I age. So I want to find out the benefits of these. Uh, co-ops, these worker co-ops uh, providing home health care. I did have somebody on the show from the New York Home Health Care. I think they had 1,500 em- uh, worker employees, uh, worker mm-hmm. owners. And so that's one of the largest worker co-ops in the U.S. And he was talking about both the good parts and the hard parts, hard parts of getting paid from the people they provide and getting the insurance company to pay the worker co-ops, what they'll pay other people and all of that stuff. So there's some, there's some it's not the easiest thing in the world to do to to run a worker co-op, but it's extremely rewarding, both financially and otherwise. So, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that. So that starts at one fifteen tomorrow. So right now we're starting at 9 o'clock in the morning. And um, to learn about how to start a cooperative from a Haitian lady going into technical, two technical workshops with a lady that is – I've uh, been doing social social justice work since uh, 9-11. And a white guy is teaching black and brown young people about so, uh, co-ops in a media company, how to not only how to run a co-op, but how you can work with uh, TV and, ca- I guess, camera work, uh, how, you, yeah. how you can get in there and do that work. Great, 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 great knowledge to get at an early age. And then at noon, you have a cleaning and landscaping. And I did talk to you about sometimes that's all people can do because they don't have any other skill sets, and so they can't work with their hands. And sometimes they get joy out of it. There are people that like being outside doing landscaping. But the question is, why work for somebody else when you can work for yourself? Uh, and that can be extremely rewarding and time-consuming. 
And then we go to 115 home care worker, and Georgia and her partner created this worker cooperative of helping helping seniors. I don't remember the stat, but uh, the boomers, which you and I are in, I didn't know you were in that category. I, I know you weren't a millennium, but, uh, Deborah, but I didn't know you were in a boomer with me. So, A younger end of the boomer generation. You and the young, okay, I'm on, all right, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I heard something like 70%, some high number, I don't remember, 70, 75, 80% of small businesses in the U.S. are owned by boomers. And you talked about 41,000, you'd be talking about that today, uh, companies in Indiana alone owned by boomers. And that's a great place to convert these from uh, individual owners to worker owners. Just a great place. So you might be working for somebody out there. You might be working for somebody, and you could help perhaps to give that your boss another option of how he can sell his – and there are some tax breaks for doing that, how they can sell it to create a worker co-op and become an owner and get help from some company like ICDC to help convert that to worker co-op and get the training you need. What else are you guys doing? This sounds like a lot and a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. So as you mentioned, we're doing uh, the webinar about converting to a worker co-op. That's right after this broadcast. We are starting work now on our food co-op conference that will be held next year. We also do some work in farmers markets. They're not, they don't necessarily organize as a co-op. They could Um, But food is a very necessary part of life, so really trying to make sure that the farmers that feed us have another channel in which to sell their product. Your your food co-op conference up and coming, when is that? We haven't announced the dates yet, so I'm going to hold that back. Um, It's going to be in May, and we'll announce it shortly on the up-and-coming website. And it, it breaks my heart to do it, but it's going to be a virtual event this year. Um, and we, we, we haven't sent out an official notification yet, but given the current situation with the pandemic, we just didn't see how we could bring people together from across the country and ensure that there wasn't the possibility that, you know, someone could get sick. And we certainly don't want that to happen. So along with a lot of other people, it will be a virtual event. Okay. Deb, uh, heading out, we, we've got a minute or so left. What, what, do you, what message do you want to leave people with? That if you have thought about owning your own business, but this thought terrifies you, there is a solution, and it's called a cooperative. You can create that business with other like-minded people who have that same issue or that same need. It's not an easy road to hoe, but it certainly is rewarding on the other end. Not only are you creating a business, you are, you know, you're creating jobs, you are uplifting people in the community, you are really helping to um help with the economic and community development of your community. So if that's something that you have always wanted to do, start your own business, then look at the co-op business model as a potential solution. Go to icdc.coop. Sign up, hit the events tab, sign up for this tomorrow so you can learn how to start your own business. If you've ever thought about it, as Deb just said, or if you're tired of you working for somebody or you're frustrated or if you don't have a job, go to icdc.coop, find out how you can start your own co-op. Deb, thank you so very much. It's a pleasure always talking to you. And everybody out there, please live cooperatively this week, and we'll see you next Thursday. Thank you, Deb. Mm-hmm.